Welcome back to our special footy show story on depression in rugby league. In part two, we hear about Rennie Matua's battle with depression and suicide and the remarkable story of how his teammate and best friend saved his life. It's Matua, he's having a big night, Rennie Matua, back himself to the line. And that is Matua. Rennie Matua has scored. Rugby league star Rennie Matua has achieved things in his career that others could only dream of. But like Moses and Preston, he's also struggled with the demons of depression. Dealing with an ongoing injury, the pressures of captaining a losing team and an uncertain playing future, Rennie gave in to his overwhelming sadness and he broke down in the dressing rooms of Suncorp Stadium on August 16 last year, two days before he attempted suicide. As I came into the sheds, I just broke down t in tears and I'm, I wasn't sure why. I just had no clue why I was so upset. The macho-ness of a football player, everyone, you know, we're supposed to be bulletproof humans that are tough and go through it. And I've never been a person that would sort of show my emotion like that. And, and it was, that was, that was the embarrassing thing for me. I felt embarrassed of, why I was, I didn't know why I was so upset. And um, it was just like a, a pressure valve getting released. It was just, it all came out and I couldn't stop it. And that leads to August 18. What are your thoughts of that day? August 18th was, was something I'd been thinking about previously. Um, it, it was a thought that came into my head a lot, more often, more often than not, and I couldn't understand why I'd kept thinking about ending my life. And some days it'd, it'd come, and then I'd snap out of it pretty quickly. And then for weeks and weeks and weeks, it just gradually got worse and worse. And then to the point where I thought about it every day, every single day, I'd lay in bed thinking that. Um, I was better off not being alive. Um, that I was a disappointment to myself and to my family and to the people around me. And it was like this parasite in my head just telling me that I wasn't good enough, uh, that I'd been an underachiever in my career. And there was a point where I just thought, yep, I've had enough, it's time to go. I remember thinking about just my family. I couldn't get my family, couldn't get my mum's face out of my head. But the pain that I was in for a long period of time, I just couldn't handle anymore. Once you've decided, and this will be very hard for people to understand, how do you then come up with the method of ending your life? I knew, um, I knew what would happen and how I would die by the way I was doing it, going to do it. Um, I knew it would be, um, it would be quick and, and, and over pretty fast, so, um, yeah, it was, um, it wasn't hard for me to decide, you know, how I was going to do it. I knew that once the um, once something was pulled tight, that that was it. What were your what were your final thoughts? Do you remember? The final things I remember is just trying to get that last bit of breath in, you know feeling that point of where I was about to pass out. That's the, um, that's the last things I remember. As Rennie was drawing his last breath, fate kicked in. His teammate and best friend, Willie Tonga, was unable to sleep that night and was awake to receive a phone call from Rennie's sister, Megan, concerned over a text message she'd received from Rennie. From that point on, Willie's intuition kicked in. I was laying in bed, 
not knowing what to do, and then something just told me just to get up and drive to his house. So I um, you know, I, I got dressed as quick as I could. I drove to his unit as quick as I could. Um, put him at 2:30, and I saw. I pulled up out the front and I saw his light on in his room. Um, I walked over to, I ran over to his room, um, just underneath, and I yelled out to him. And I could hear music in the background. And then it stopped. And so, when I heard the music stop, I ran around to the to the main entrance of the of the unit. Um, it was open, like usually it's, ne it's never open. And then I went straight to Rennie's room and opened his room and then that's when I just saw Rennie um, trying to take his own life. How long was there in you not getting there that Rennie might have taken his own life? I, re I reckon if I was five seconds later, um, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Wow. Um, he wasn't with it at the time. Like, it's like when someone comes out of, out of water for a breath of air. Yeah. That's how his um, reaction was to that. My next thoughts were, you know, like I was crying and all I kept saying to Willie is that I don't want to, I don't want to live anymore. I didn't want to live. And um, he didn't leave my side till, till it would have been daylight. Why Willie was awake that night, we'll never know. But it's something that Rennie will always be grateful for. This is the first time they will sit down together and talk about August 18, the night Willie saved his best friend's life. What about what he did that night? Yeah, I, um, we haven't really spoken about it too much. It's not something we like to talk about. I feel like I wish I did more to help him because of what he had to see and, and what I put him through, so. Do you feel guilty, in a way, through what he went through? Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. The next couple of days after it, I was really mad and, like, I was thinking that's selfish. Like, you've got so much behind here, like, you know, your family. That's when I started to realise that depression is a disease. And I didn't know that. I didn't know that he was, he had that. Rennie, those th three weeks, two or three weeks after you tried to take your life, what space were you in? Yeah, I had no emotional attachment to it whatsoever. Yeah, that was the scariest period out of all of it, is that um, I'd hurt a lot of people, but I didn't care. I didn't care what effects it had on anyone else. I just wanted to, I wanted to end it. And I was um, completely willing to do it again, but do it properly. Willie, the night you saved Rennie, you were acting on instinct. After that, it must have been a feeling of being scared of what he was capable of doing now and, and you maybe not being able to get there on time. Yeah, I, I guess. I guess you can say that I was, you know, acting out of fear. Like, if I wasn't there for him again, then, you know, I, I don't know how I'd be able to cope with it. Mm -hmm. This is a phenomenal friendship you guys have got. He's always tried to keep me on the right path. I don't think he realises how, how much of a special person he is. I honestly don't believe he, he realises that and it's more than a friendship, you know, he, he's my brother. Suicide is preventable and Preston and Rennie are proving to be the hope that the next generation of players need by bravely telling their stories. Preston makes his way to all NRL clubs educating players on the signs of depression. Firstly, thanks for letting me come down today, have a yarn with you guys. Suicide is it's mind blowing. It's the biggest killer of our men in, in Australia. <laughs> and through Suicide Prevention Australia, Rennie is raising awareness. Footy players don't 
don't have depression or they don't go through the same things that we're above everyone, but we're just as human as everyone else. Their message is simple, education, awareness and communication. Their motivation, to never see another player go through what they have and for the lives of the players we've lost to not be in vain. Sometimes it seems that people think, you know, just because we're footy players, uh, we don't go through the same situations that other people do. Um, footy players are affected by it just as much as anyone else. I think that's a massive message, you know, being, being able to feel comfortable, to be able to talk to someone that you trust and, and someone who's willing to listen. The clubs especially can make it more of an open issue and uh, make guys feel like it's the norm to be able to talk about it, not something that it, to be insecure about. So I think that's a big thing. What do you say? to the bloke out there, the big tough bloke who's got issues and doesn't speak? Well, I think for footballers, anyone can be tough, you know? Um, but it doesn't take a tough man to come forward and say you need help. It takes a strong man. Um, tell them my story. It might not reach everyone, but it may reach one or two people, and that's that, for me, is the reason why I do it. You probably never thought you'd suffer from depression. I never thought I would suffer from it. Are we doing enough? Are we too scared of it? Suicide's not a word that people like to speak about too often. It's just knowing the indicators of when people might be depressed. That's what people need to be more uh, aware of and educated on. There are indicators and there are signs that someone might be suffering. It sort of makes you, makes you wonder how, how many other people are going through it and um, that we don't even know of. And, you know, like I said, you know, me and Rennie's been tight, you know, for, <clears throat> you know, for 10 years now and I had no idea. Don't keep it to yourself, you know. It's not something embarrassing, if anything, you're the stronger person for actually admitting that there's something that you need help with. I hope that people can learn from those situations because I wouldn't want any family to lose someone like that when it can be prevented. Ready, Matua. He scores for the dog. They're piling them on. And straight away, it's Matua. He's having a big run. Both Rennie and Preston have been diagnosed with forms of depression and through medication and counselling, they're lucky to be here to tell their stories. What about the, the, the gratitude you must feel, the second chance you've been given with your family? Well, you know that, that old saying, um, you don't know what you've lost until it's gone. Mm. You know, I never really understood it. I really understand it now, you know, the, the fact that I'm alive, I'm grateful for that. The fact that I've got a, a beautiful wife, um, beautiful family, and I've got people that love me. Um, you know, what's, there, what's more to be grateful about, you know? I just feel, I know life's not perfect, but I feel it feels very close to perfect. Just my whole outlook on life, you know? Just the clarity I have in life now. I've learned, you know, to communicate with people again. Will's introduced me to a, a girl and <laughs> so yeah, no, I'm pretty, I'm pretty happy at the moment. <laughs> That's official now. <laughs> <laughs> Sadly for Shanice and Taya, there's no second chance and life will never be the same. There will always be unanswered questions, but Shanice has learned to accept Moses' death and he's hopeful that by sharing his story, it may save at least one person's life. I'm happy where I am, and I hope that Moses, wherever he is, like he's proud of me and he's proud of what I'm doing with Taya, because it's not easy, but I'm doing as best I can. I'm sure he'd be very proud. He better be. <laughs> <laughs>